so my name's Ben Lissington. I'm a designer and writer based here in London. Well, with my friend is Alana Gaynor, and uh, I run an experimental design studio called Department of No. And what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is uh, space travel and space settlement. Uh, as the archetype of kind of massive, wildly ambitious social t socio-technical projects, uh, and the possibility of an adequately speculative approach to these kinds of things. So, I mean, this is something that's very much present in popular culture at the moment, which is getting this kind of jaw-clenched space lust to it. Uh, after the 20th century history of space travel, which was largely a kind of decades-long sports day where you got medals for kind of the first satellite in space and then dog and then monkey and then human and then the first person on landing on the moon and that kind of thing. Um, and here actually is Neil Armstrong getting a medal. Um, and this kind of is a project that stalled for various reasons, sort of political, economic, short circuits, and was very much full of nationalist flag waving and, and this kind of thing. Um, and... But over the last sort of, uh, probably even over the last five years, this has come back with a vengeance. Uh, in fact, the recent opinion polls in the US show there's a greater level of support for government investment in space than there has ever been, apart from uh, the month either side of the first moon landing. Uh, and this is fueled by all kinds of things. You've got Cu the Curiosity Rover and its Twitter account, which is this sort of, this weird, I don't know if you've ever come across it, this kind of like weird experiential thing of the Curiosity Rover tweeting at you, and you know that it's not, but at the same time it's saying things like, don't flip out. Um, and sort of managing your emotions for you. Then you have companies like Planetary Resources who are all jacked up on venture capital trying to open mines in the sky. Uh, you have, in just a few days ago, uh, sort of multi-millionaire or billionaire, Dennis Tito, uh, who has announced a project to launch a mission, a manned mission to Mars in 2018, where he's going to send a middle-aged couple into orbit around Mars, um, which is like, it sounds like a pitch from some kind of insane sitcom writer who's like on the verge of an alcoholic breakdown. Um, and this kind of stuff is entering popular culture in other ways as well. I mean, even the, the, the traditional opponents of this kind of like grand technological project, uh, people who use arguments like, we should sort our problems out here first before we go elsewhere, um, are starting to realise that this climate, ch climate change stuff they've been talking about for the last couple of decades uh, is actually going to happen and it's going to be pretty horrific and lots of people are going to die. Uh, and if you don't invest in things like escape hatches, then that's actually, yeah, it's going to be quite a problem. Uh, so what I'm interested in really here is, as I was saying, the possibility of like a, a kind of adequately speculative approach to this, because they're mostly, for all this kind of new cultural enthusiasms for space, um, a kind of matrix of motivations and, and speculations which sort of fit actually quite well together even though they're very different things like you know, rapacious capitalist exploration and uh, humanitarian narratives of escaping extinction and so on sit strangely well together um, but they're, they're kind of just exporting into orbit you know quite conventional understandings of what's going on I mean in the very idea that sort of the main thing that space presents to us is new territory to open up minds is not you know uh, really an adequate conception of what's actually happening here when you throw, you know, little meat sacks up into the space and, uh, and they do their thing. And how does, so I'm interested in hearing the relation between basically, you know, kind of the surface of the Earth and the activity that's going on it uh, and what's going on beyond the outer curve of the Earth's gravity well, but rethinking that in kind of more interesting ways than maybe there are at the moment. So how is this to be done? I think... You can start by returning to a quite obscure idea of uh, cosmism, the original body of thought of which current rationales to go into space are, are kind of like degenerated uh, versions. Um, and in particular, the, the guy who, if anyone can really be said to have uh, their thoughts to have kick-started the, uh, the space race would be uh, Nikolai Fedorov, who was this guy. This is not actually him, obviously. Um, but he was a reclusive ascetic, uh, the illegitimate son of a minor prince who was writing in Moscow in the late 1800s, uh, dedicating years of his life to this kind of heretical masterwork, which was never published in his lifetime, apart from tiny anonymous fragments, um, but was uh, to prove incredibly influential, particularly from people who came to visit him in the library where he worked and, and wrote after hours. Uh, this is a book called uh, The Philosophy of the Common Task, here in all its print-on-demand glory. Um, it's beautiful. 
Um, and it's basically the first serious and systematic program and rationale for sending humans into space. The first uh, attempt not only to justify that in, you know, kind of like moral, ethical, political and so on terms comprehensively, but also to sort of programmatically adduce exactly how this would have to happen and what would be the necessary preconditions of it and so on. So, I mean, time this afternoon doesn't really permit a full rundown of his very ingenious and very strange uh, argument. But his, his basic subject was the perpetuation of the human race. In the first instance, by finding a way to solve war. And this was the common task of the book's title, uh, which was his kind of a central problematic, was to find a, a, a single challenge to human life that was so universal that every human being could recognise it and agree to work together to do something about it. Uh, and in short, I mean, he took this enemy to be the surface of the Earth itself, and in particular gravity and all its kind of exhausting effects on us, and time, in particular the human lifespan. Uh, and he basically positioned these as being kind of contingent properties of terrestrial history and said these cannot be assumed to be absolute limits to human behaviour. Um, there are ways around this. We can escape these things. Uh, we don't have to accept their dominion, we don't have to live our lives ruled by them necessarily, and so on. And the shape of the particular solution uh, which uh, he came up with, you know, the formulation of the common task was, was twofold and was best articulated by some of his later followers after the Russian Revolution, uh, who articulated this as storm the heavens and conquer death, which is a nice, you know, grand project to embark upon. Uh, and it's pretty striking in his vision. I mean, he, he was an accelerationist before the fact, effectively. Um, but this was all tied up in incredibly conservative ideas. I mean, it was a deeply humanist project. Uh, in fact, you know, when I said that it was a heretical work, he was uh, deeply Christian. And he thought that the Book of Revelations was uh, less a, a sort of mystical thing and was more a kind of operating manual for what should be done with science, like issuing in thousand-year reigns of peace and so on. Um, and actually, all the people that he influenced directly or indirectly still have this, this kind of actual, sort of strange kind of human celebrating thing when at the same time they're advocate, advocating you know, like complete shifts away from what we think human life is supposed to be. Uh, so a couple of examples of this, I mean, directly in relation to the, the space race, is a commemorative stamp of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, uh, who was a 16-year-old almost deaf runaway, I think, um, who kind of bumped into... Uh, into Fedorov and ended up designing the first rocket trajectory equations. He designed the first multi-stage booster rocket, um, airlocks, moon bases, and, and so on. He's in Russia, he's still regarded as kind of the father of, of the so-called space race. Um, and again, very, very humanist project of kind of like a celebration of mankind and kind of leaving the planet, this sort of thing. Uh, and even in the most sort of intensely scientific kind of cosmos followers, I mean, there were some who were, frankly, were just bollocks, which I won't just talk about, because they were just kind of like, oh, it's all about, you know, the love of God and Christian mysticism, uh, which is actually kind of a hard sell, uh, believe it or not. Um, but like, even the most scientific, this sort of tainted even the most scientific uh, interpretations or extensions of Federal's project, like the project by his friend uh, Vladimir Panadsky, who, who didn't come up with the idea of the biosphere itself, but kind of uh, formulated in its modern sense, uh, in kind of fascinatingly anti-humanist terms. He was a geologist, and he just saw human life and the life of everything on Earth as just an unfolding geological process. Uh, did a lot of the early work on kind of mapping out actually what elements make up the human body and what proportion and so on. So I think there are ideas here that we can kind of return to and radicalize, basically, um, which um, recast this as something which is more interesting and opens up other avenues and ways that we think about such things as space settlement or other massive social technical projects. And in order to do this, we need to think about what is actually the cosmic impulse itself, like its kind of characteristic gesture or its basic gambit. Uh, which is to understand the Earth and the conditions that it affords human life to be a trap. Um, and in turn, to consider the basic task of philosophy, economics, and design to be devising means of uh, escape. Which is uh, a kind of a project of fashion in general, right, that would operate at the maximum possible scale. It's a heist where the whole human species kind of steals itself out of the vault. Uh, and this kind of synchronizes quite well with. Um, uh, a project of reinterpreting uh, what we normally think of as design uh, that is well underway um, as a department of note, which is to see in the 
design um, uh, a practice which operates according to the logic of the trap really, really deeply. Um, traps based on deviating existing behaviours into new trajectories. Um, and the basic act of design from this point of view is, as, uh, as Robin actually brilliantly summarised uh, before, so I just have to cast your minds back rather than have me mangle it, uh, an activity of plotting, basically. The designer is a kind of weaver of plots, uh, manipulator of situations and so on. Always very weak possession. Uh, position. This is very much the uh, design as the weapon of the week, not the not sort of the impression of grand preconceived plans and sort of, you know, sort of more or less resisting matter, but rather the manipulation of tendencies are already in the environment. Um, and this has been recognised in various ways in, uh, in different cultures through history, uh, although it's it's kind of uh, unfamiliar to us in the West today. Um, in one way in which this has been uh, formulated in ancient Greece was uh, as matrix of cunning intelligence, which was the kind of um, the property of intelligent action that would be witnessed in the uh, in, in courtly intri intrigues, in sort of daring military strategies, uh, in the sailing ships, and in the skill of those of construction, all of which have uh, something to do with getting human things off planet, obviously. But it's slightly more relevant to our, our kind of the, the wildly grand ambitions of cosmism that we're talking about. Uh, another way which has been formulated is uh, in an anonymous 13th century Arabic text called The Subtle Ruse, um, it was translated by Rani Kalman back in the early 80s, which is a book of folk tales um, celebrating sly and guileful behaviour which, which were often associated with some kind of technical operation. Um, and what concerns us here is not really the substance of that, but the the unnamed author's interesting position at the beginning of the book when he talks about what actually is intelligence and what makes human, humans intelligent in a way that other animals aren't. And he doesn't invoke, you know, kind of the soul or, for that matter, language or anything like that. He basically says that, you, that animals, um, they can do, we see them as intelligent when they do ingenious things, especially when they kind of escape from us, like, you know, a rat that we've caught and somehow manages to get out or what have you. Um, but they're very inflexible in these kinds of behaviours, and human beings are exactly the same. They're just much, much more flexible and adaptable. And that this is expressed in, in their ability to create architecture and, and so on. So he places this a continuum of animals up through humans to, uh, to God as being a kind of far more sophisticated architect than human beings are, which is a nice sort of flattening of the ontological position. Um, and yeah, so basically his conclusion here is that um, humans are more like animal, uh, sorry, Humans are more like God than are other animals because they're more cunning. And this cunning is expressed through being able to migrate into new environments, kind of adapt to them and adapt them in turn. And weirdly, actually, to sort of follow a kind of speculative trajectory, this whole thing about humans being kind of really flexibility, uh, being flexible and migratory, uh, has kind of interesting resonances with work in paleoanthropology, which really should be taken with a pinch of salt because it's... Uh, it's about as speculative as a scientific discipline as you can get, given the sparsity of them. You know, I'm sure many paleoanthropologists wouldn't like me uh, <laughs> kind of saying that. But, um, and in recent, well, I mean, actually not that recent, over the last 50 years or so, it seems more and more conclusive that our early ancestors began using tools and that transformed their bodies rather than the other way around. That, um, that basically our differentiation from the other great apes um, is really around kind of tool use and this has completely transformed us both psychologically and cognitively into more and more skilled manipulator of environments. So in a sense, sort of playing this speculative cosmos card here, in a sense, this is kind of like a rehash of the fav famous scene in uh, 2001 where you get, you know, the monkey like, learns to kill and then throws the bone in the air and then it turns into a spaceship. Um, only here we haven't got some kindly black monolith you know, sort of help, helping human beings along on some sort of ineffable quest like, to, to spiritually develop and mature in the cosmos. Uh, it's more the logic of, of, you know, some kind of like street urchin or common thief, you know, kind of like pulling a hustle. Um, the human beings sort of historically, I mean, very long term historically, being able to uh, progressively develop their skills and being incredibly crafty and cunning and ingenious and able to deal with more and more different situations. So, I won't go too far into that because we're kind of running out of time. 
Um, but would ask this kind of like, well, what is this actually, is this kind of pathway, which I should say is this is not some sort of cosmic destiny thing at all. It's totally contingent, just building up and up and up and up. Uh, complexity of like technological uh, society. Um, like, where does it actually leave with the kind of cosmism today? So, I think we'd have to reconceive it as a sort of generalised escapology. It's kind of a horizon point of cunning. And the point here, when you look at things like, you know, settling off worlds and so on, is if you remember Fedorov and his war against gravity and death, that we're not, that cosmism would not necessarily be about, you know, kind of mega-scale structures or that kind of thing. It's not an engineering feat in that way. But it is at its heart about taking kind of like deeper and deeper uh, presumed limits to human activity and, con and refusing to be uh, conditioned by them, refusing to see them as necessary and injecting contingency into them. Um, uh, this is not about kind of permanently escaping things necessarily. I mean, you can't get rid of gravity. It's some kind of fundamental property of, uh, of space-time, it would appear. Um, but you can certainly manipulate it. You can find ways to get out of the gravity well, or in the example of gravitational slingshotting, you can actually use gravity as a way to kind of accelerate the passage of a mammoth body and so on. This is taking something previously conceived as a, a limit, as a given, um, before Fedorov, and saying, well, actually, this can now be manipulated as part of a technological structure. I think the, the sort of flip side of this as well is that there's a very strong cosmist tendency to, um, to look at what, to try and order things on a very, very large scale. So Sergei Bulgakov, for instance, who wrote um, a book called The Philosophy of Economics, which was published uh, in 1911, I think, um, talked about the interesting thing about the idea of economics that emerged kind of within the course of his lifetime was that you take all these little individual economic interactions and you're able to say, like, well, if we pull this together into the idea of an economy, then we can start to actually do things with that economy. Uh, in his case, what he called humanizing the universe, um, which is a sort of typical kind of cosmos line. Uh, the same thing probably holds true here for design as well. We have all these uh, kind of uh, coin tricks, effectively. Um, all these little acts of craftiness and ingenuity that are all kind of incredibly disordered and distributed and um, uh, a part of many different projects. And that would be the, the second side of, I guess, a renewed cosmism, as I would see it, which would be the integration of these things into more and more sophisticated plots. This is effectively... We're talking about moving from, you know, an act of design is just a, a coin trick, some kind of hustle on an ancient savannah or a London design studio, um, to a proper kind of ascent of the darkness, which would be the longest con. Um, 